the uh, kind of report back to you. You'll recall last year um, you had some language in, uh, I think it went, went up, I think maybe I'm going to the expungement bill that Brendan might have been working on, and it was directing um, the Attorney General's Office, the Center for Crime Victim Services, and the network to be working together on a number of issues. And so I think you'll have some witnesses that will talk about this report, but the legislation that you have in front of you, S-217, mm -hmm. is the legislation done in response to this report. So uh, I'll let them talk to you about the report, and I'll walk you through the bill. But just so you know uh, the genesis of it and where it came from. And, um, and Senator Sears is correct. There's a bill that's up for third reading today in the House, um, H568. And it has two of the things that are in 217 and not the rest. Um, and so at some point down the road, if you want me to, I can explain. They, they didn't, it's very minor differences between the two. And that was just through the committee process over in the House. Um, so, uh, first section, section one on S-217 is introduced. Um, so this is adding uh, a section uh, in Title 13, uh, so for a sentencing for a crime committed by a victim of, uh, of trafficking who was a minor at the time of the offense. And this allows for uh, the court to use its discretion to depart from any mandatory minimums um, or mandatory additional penalties, which we, we, we typically don't have. We have penalty enhancements, but I don't think we typically have something that says you have to have a mandatory. Um, and then, or to suspend any portion of an otherwise applicable sentence in, in, in the circumstances if the person who uh, was uh, charged and convicted of the crime was under 18 years of age and the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that at any time during the one year period immediately preceding the commission of the offense, the person against whom the offense was committed trafficked the person who committed the offense. Are we asking questions later? <clears throat> is there a definition of trafficking in here? This is in the human trafficking chapter oh, oh, so where I placed it, so it's yeah. in the already okay. existing scheme for that. Yeah. 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 So, this might not be for you, but why would we limit it to under 18? So, uh, yeah, not a question for okay. me, and I think you have an advocate here who is okay. part of, this is a national movement of trying to yeah. pass these laws. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, yep. Um, okay, did, I know you have a number of witnesses, so I was just going to go kind of quickly through the bill. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. guys is okay yeah. to go to yeah. section two yeah. um, so section two uh, for immunity from liability you guys were all here when a few years ago when uh, the legislature adopted the Good Samaritan law relating to overdoses do you re yeah. remember mm -hmm. that right yeah. and so we have that law on the books in title 18 so um, what it does is it provides limited immunity for someone who calls in, if, if either they are experiencing an overdose or they're with someone who's experiencing an overdose, they can call for assistance. And when law enforcement shows up, um, if there's evidence that that person was engaged in drug activity, they wouldn't be charged based on those type, on those particular offenses under the under the Chapter 84 under the drug offenses. So, the idea being that you didn't want. Um, people to, to not call in if someone was in, in danger. Um, you didn't want them to not do it because they were fearful that they would get charged with a drug crime. So you have that, and you've had that for a number of years um, in Title 18. And this new uh, Section 2 is based on that idea. And what it would do is it would apply something similar, um, but in the context if someone is, if you look at the top of page 3, Subsection B, person who in good faith and in timely manner reports um, that he or she is either a victim to or a, a witness to a crime um, that arose from his or her involvement in prostitution or in human trafficking, um, then they would have immunity from the, the uh, crimes that are listed on page three from lines five down through line 15. And essentially what those are, are they are the misdemeanor possession, drug possession, and the lowest level felony possession. I will just note that I have on um, the marijuana possession on line seven, I have an incorrect citation. I need to add a couple things to that. It was just a technical amendment that I need to make if you decide to move forward. Um, 
Uh, and so that would provide them the date. So if somebody, let's say, if you had a, somebody who's a sex worker and um, they had a client who became violent or something and they wanted to call, uh, call the police, <coughs> that they could do that and then if police came that they didn't, the, the person who reported the crime wouldn't be charged with prostitution. And maybe if there were small amounts of drugs, they, wouldn't, they couldn't be charged with, uh, with drug possession. If there was other things outside of that context of criminal activity, they could be. So it's only immunity with regard to the, to the lower level possession and the prostitution and the prohibited conduct, that's something that is, uh, what I understand is, is sometimes charged instead of prostitution. So you might have somebody that, would, so it's a, a, another offense that someone might be charged with under there. So they would only have immunity with regard to those particular crimes. Mm -hmm. um, Next is, I'll move on to page four in section three, the sex work study committee. And if you don't mind indulging me just for a minute, I'll just <coughs> tell you a couple things. Um, I had spent a, a bit of time trying to understand our existing prostitution law. So you have, in Title 13, you have a, you have a chapter that is lewdness and prostitution. And so you have two subchapters. So the first subchapter is the lewdness, and the second one being the prostitution. And if you look at the language in there, um, it's really old. Like most of the language that's in the prostitution subchapter is 100, at least 100 years old. Um, and so I had a great time using all those dusty old books on the mezzanine outside my office, digging up and uh, tracing back all the old laws and where they came about. So you have right now the definition that is, the definition of prostitution that you have in law now um, was adopted by Vermont in 1919. I hate the term sex work, by the way. I'm sorry? I hate the term sex work. We need a better term. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it, it has certain connotations that... It does. Yeah. Isn't it supposed to? Yeah. Hmm? Isn't it supposed to? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, there certainly may be a better word. It's a better way to phrase it. Um, it has led, it, it, you know, what the problem is is public perception, and that's what we're into here. It's yeah. led to a... Um, I know. A, an effort by many yeah. to demean the effort to try well, to, to deal with this problem. And, yeah. and unfortunately, a number of people in the House have well, made public comments that leads to demeaning mm -hmm. the meaning of this work group. We're trying to update Vermont's prostitution laws, and the, the public often doesn't get things that we try to do. They often mm -hmm take one stupid thing that one House member says and yeah. makes it to be the cause, and I think we need to change it. So I already came up to that Bethel, Bethel Business Bureau meeting a couple of weeks ago, 7.30 in the morning, and <laughs> immediately some guy jumps up and says, they're doing nothing. They're trying to you know, do this and do that, and they even want to do something with prostitution and then ha 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 ha. <laughs> like, oh. no, I, that's, that's the exact problem. That's exactly And I think yeah, we need a yeah. better yeah, okay. better view of this. And you know, it, it should be a study committee to update Vermont's laws regarding <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. I was going to say, don't call it body work, because we've got the massage. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, no I, think, I think what we're trying to do is up, update yeah. Vermont laws. Yeah. Okay. to try to um, deal with the human trafficking problem. I think everybody, every thinking person, I shouldn't say everybody, but every person with half a brain recognizes there's a huge problem of human trafficking, and I think that's yeah. what we really want to focus on. Yes. How should Vermont laws be upgraded in order to upgrade? There is, a, there is an email from a prostitute in Nevada, legal, I saw that. You see that's that? you know, but that's just but that that yeah. just feeds that narrative. That's the problem. And the it house members, ah, 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 you Don't know. Don't she make a million dollars last year? Well, that's yeah. her. I, mean, I hope I she know. paid taxes she on it. I'd like to see her IRS. Yeah, she's an illegal. I hope she paid plenty of taxes, and that's more power to her that she could make a million dollars. 
see why people don't want to But do again, that. I'll only say that I don't want to make light of this. No, it's no, a serious no. problem. Human trafficking is a serious yeah. problem, especially amongst kids. And many times they're running drugs for somebody mm -hmm. that results in their either uh, running the drugs as a result of human trafficking or um, providing sexual um, mm -hmm. favors. So that's the problem we're trying to address. Huh? May I ask yeah. Michelle a sure. question about yeah. this? So uh, Section 1 applies only to a victim of human trafficking, and that Section 2 applies to prostitution or human trafficking. Is that yes. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, so if I just, going to your point about the, about the, the work of the committee, so in, in talking about the, that these laws are 100 years old, and I traced a number of them back, so you still have the 1919 definition of prostitution, which I think we've talked a little bit about. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and that includes uh, offering, receiving the body, either for hire or indiscriminate sexual intercourse without right. hire. Um, you also have, and I don't know if you probably remember this, a number of years ago, um, I, think, uh, it, I think it maybe it was in 2001, and there was a sex offender bill that, that we all worked on, and um, we had to, and we noticed that in the prostitution chapter it still referred to female, and it talked about white slave traffic. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. And, yeah. And so even though the sex offender bill wasn't dealing with the prostitution chapter, we went, and that was like really the, the, the most modern amendments to the prostitution chapter for decades and decades and decades, is that just to strike the gender provisions in there, and there was this, and you still have the slave traffic statute on the books. And what that was is in 1910, Congress had passed um, uh, the, uh, the White Slave Traffic Act, and the what it did, it was prohibited persons from transporting women across state lines for either prostitution or immoral purposes. And then Vermont that same year passed a state version of that. And so you still have that on there. And, and so the only amendments that have come to that were in 2001 where we struck the word white, but the slave traffic stayed there because you hadn't yet adopted your human trafficking chapter, which right. you did later on in 2011. And, um, but that slave traffic law, the history of that was that was used uh, oftentimes to um, prosecute men of color who were having relationships, romantic oh. relationships with with white women, um, and, and so you still have on the books in Vermont um, this thing of, of prohibiting of transporting a, a woman for, well, it doesn't say woman anymore, for immoral purposes. And so you have a lot of really super we have a antiquated. Lot of old law yeah. on the books, yeah. that, that law came up in my caseload many, many years ago in terms of the state's attorney said, hey, I, I'll get the guy on this taking a kid into New York State from Vermont. He, not right on it with the really? it was, yeah. Try. All right. Take uh, the right along, Michelle. So the um, so the the study committee. Um, you'll see the membership on page four, subsection B. Um, and this is, and I, the advocates will talk to you about this. But last year, you would ask them to look at modernizing the prostitution uh, statutes, and they came back in their report and said, "We would like to do this as part of a larger working group with more mm -hmm. stakeholders at the table." And so that's why you have more people mm -hmm. here in this one. So there's nine folks on here. Um, you'll see subsection C. Uh, the duties of the committee are to um, develop a modern approach to state involvement in sexual activity for hire by consenting adults while maintaining criminal penalties for trafficking, coercion, and exploitation of minors and strong protections for victims of those crimes. Um, it would be, the product would be a piece of legislation rather than a, a report. Um, Ledge Council would staff it. Um, and the report would be due, the, the legislation would be due in December. Okay, move on. Mm -hmm. So page six, mm -hmm. um, section four, so motion to vacate by victim of domestic assault. So there's one, uh, for this one uh, is relating to vacating um, if you're a victim of domestic assault and then the next section is if you are, uh, have been a victim of sexual assault. Again, these were two recommendations of the study committee. And you recall last year what you passed, 
was you tweaked the law with regard to uh, being able to vacate um, a conviction if you were a victim of human trafficking. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. And this is basically taking what you had passed last year with, re with respect to victims of human trafficking and extending it in Section 4 under the, um, the subchapter for domestic assault. So, and then on the next one, um, adding a similar provision in the chapter for sexual assault. And so, uh, again, the process is the same. Mm -hmm. um, so someone who, uh, uh, you know, is convicted of a qualifying crime, and you'll recall that uh, you exempted, remember one of the things was exempting the, the more mean, serious crimes. They can vacate any crime? Well, if you look at quali the qualifying crime, yeah. um, and it's any crime but the, what is it? The, I can't remember. Is it the Big 12 or the Big 13? I don't know why I can't remember. Big 12. Okay. So it's anything but the Big 12. And you guys had a discussion about that, whether to include the Big 12 and the human trafficking one last year, and then ask the study committee to look whether or not you yeah. should sweep it in. They said keep it out for now. Yeah, that, we, um, that may, uh, I've had some comments offline with the state, state's attorneys. I think there's some concern about how broad that is. Um, but can I ask a question about that? Yep. This, this doesn't say that it will be vacated. This says that they can <coughs> apply for a motion to vacate and then the decision is made on a case-by-case. Yes. Is that um, well, if you see, you have to look at the standard. So page then? seven. Um, okay. So page, uh, subsection D, the court shall grant the motion if it finds by preponderance of the evidence that the moving party was convicted of a qualifying crime and the conviction was obtained as a result of the moving parties having been a victim of, in this case, domestic assault. So, um, so uh, take it back to what you have on the books now and thinking about the, uh, when you're talking about the, in the context of human trafficking, if someone was a victim of human trafficking and maybe as part of their, uh, the control relationship and things that were going on, perhaps that person was also selling drugs or doing something like that, but it was a part of, as a direct result of them being trafficked. Then I thought that we would be did some language two years ago that allowed that to be a um, what do you call it? an affirmative defense. Didn't we make a person was a victim of human trafficking? It was an affirmative defense, or I can do it. I can do it. Seems like to I recollect doing something like that. Well, you have the you have the motion to vacate on human trafficking has been there for a long time. You guys just tweaked it and broadened it last yeah, year. But I think there's. Uh, uh, well, mitigating factor. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you for. Are you still continuing on? Yeah, yeah, just with regard to B, mm -hmm. nine, page seven. So I'm thinking about the St. Johnsbury case. Two people, and if the, if the one of those if one of those persons had been a victim of domestic assault, they might be able to get out uh, a murder charge. Help. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the... the oh, they uh, murdered the... the right, they, the they were convicted of murdering the teacher in St. Johnsbury. Oh, no, but, what and, was the, we were talking about that case. Yes. And the people that were it was together. alleged that the man was a victim of domestic assault, I believe, and that he was following the woman who um, told him to murder this the teacher. And so... I think what Senator. That's what I'm thinking of. Well, you, you exempted the Big 12 out, so those crimes would not be eligible. I don't, I don't know what the charge was in that case. Well, it was murder. murder. Well, was it murder? Was it that the charge for both of them? Yeah. One of them pled guilty. Yeah, and the other, and the other he one went to trial. trial. The man was convicted at in trial, trial. aggravated, and the woman pled down to first degree murder. <coughs> I don't know. I don't remember, but and this and this is the same policy thing you were grappling with last year in the context of yeah. extending this up to human trafficking was how broad what yeah, what group of crimes should should you know have this available um, so. Um,
And then the the section five is just as I mentioned, it's the same thing, but at, but applied to uh, victims of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So um, for purposes of this, you know, I only had it applied to things that were under the sexual assault statute. You obviously have a lot of other sex crimes and other areas of law. So again, you know, in thinking about what crimes you want to fall under for the for the immunity, um, you know, we can go we can go through those. But maybe once you've already heard from the witnesses and they're thinking about why their recommendations are what they are. I ask a question. No, sorry. Could, could we get a definition here of domestic assault and sexual assault? Sure. Yeah, it's just it, these both of these sections go in those particular uh, chapters, but I uh, yeah. so they have existing definitions, but in I'll put them out chapters, for you. Yeah. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Uh, the next witness is James Bowles, who's here from Washington, D.C., via Las Vegas, via. <laughs> And we're going to call Sarah. She's going to listen in at the same time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sarah. Many of you. Oh, no, no. So. Is it Sarah? Is it somebody that you can call us your last name or no? Oh, she's on the official name. She's on the. Her name is on the. Some of you remember, may remember James. He yes. worked for the yes. Polaris. Yeah, may I speak? Some of you may remember James. Six two six nine eight six nine one two. Um, Thank you. Machine, machine picked up. Okay. Um, make sure. Six two six nine eight six nine one two eight. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Machine's on. Um, I guess we'll call her in five minutes. We can try again. Okay. I guess. Some of you may remember James. He worked yes. for the Polaris Project several years ago and was here before this committee. And uh, welcome back. Um, we got I got his email and I couldn't put a face to it until last night when I saw you in the well, He's also a San Francisco 49er. <laughs> so we made it to the Super Bowl, but he didn't play the Patriots, unfortunately. <laughs> so James, welcome back. Thank you. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your new capacity and why you're interested in this bill. And you heard a few questions from committee members, and maybe you can comment on that. Absolutely. Well, uh, Senator Sears, thank you so much for inviting me to come back to. Uh, By the way, Senator Benning is in court today, mm -hmm. and Senator Baruth is in Albuquerque. I have no idea what's in Albuquerque. <laughs> I, I believe Other it's sand. sunshine. I believe it's yeah. sunshine. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's for his job. I think it's for his other job. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I may apologize for not being here. But you yeah, have the three most important members. <laughs> Let's do that. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for having me back. And uh, yes, and we also appreciate Jimmy Garoppolo. That was a very kind gift yeah. from <laughs> the Cuban Patriots. Uh, it was. <laughs> um, James Dole, for the record, I'm the CEO and founder of Human Rights for Kids, which is a human rights organization that is advocating on behalf uh, and trying to advance human rights pr protections for kids in various systems, including the criminal justice system, as well as in education, child welfare, and juvenile justice. Central to our organizing principle is the idea that when we look at how most kids end up in the criminal justice system, it's as a result of adverse childhood experiences and early childhood trauma. We believe that most of the social ills in our country could be traced back to the harm that children experience in their early childhood. And so what we're trying to do is raise awareness about the connection between ACEs and these negative life outcomes for children. And that's really what kind of brings us uh, into Vermont today to talk about this really important piece of legislation. Um, and, you know, the genesis for this for me, um, I shall say, is when I was first working at Polaris Project on anti human trafficking legislation. As a matter of fact, I think the same year I was working and came to speak to the committee, uh, I came across the case of uh, Sarah Cruzan, who at that time was serving a life without parole sentence in the state of California for having killed her sex trafficker. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to get her on the, the phone a little later so committee members can directly hear her story. Um, but for me, it was the first time that I really learned that 
these draconian punishments were really imposed on children at all, let alone a child sex trafficking victim who had only been in that situation because of somebody who had been raping and trafficking her. And I wish I could say that that was the only instance in the country where we see cases like this. Um, and I used to think too, like, well, maybe it was just because it was so long ago, 1994, um, that her case happened. So we didn't know a whole lot about sex trafficking at the time. So a lot of people could be forgiven maybe for not realizing what happens to a child sex trafficking victim and why they end up in those situations and may, why they might see their only way out as killing their, their trafficker. Uh, unfortunately, last year in the state of Wisconsin, um, they charged a 15-year-old girl, Crystal Kaiser, uh, with killing a man who had been raping and trafficking her. Um, Crystal, she's currently on trial right now, going through the process. Um, she was a young girl who, like most trafficking victims, had been abused and neglected and exploited her entire life. And there was a man who uh, took advantage of that and exploited her vulnerabilities. And actually, uh, ironically, the police had uh, identified that he was a pedophile who had over 200 images of child pornography on his computer. He had been arrested. Um, he gets released on bond. Within two weeks from his release, he's exploiting Crystal again. So she goes over to his house. Uh, he's trafficking her. He's, uh, engaged, he's exploiting her through prostitution. And uh, she then kills him. And of course, they lock her up right away and are charging her with first degree murder. Uh, a couple of years ago in Ohio, there's a young girl by the name of Alexis Martin. Uh, Alexis was 15 years old. Now, she actually wasn't the person who killed her trafficker. She uh, was a felony murder case. Uh, she was 15 years old. Um, she had been raped and trafficked uh, by this man. And she decided that she was going to enter in an agreement with a bunch of other boys uh, to rob her trafficker. So she is in the next room being raped by her trafficker's brother uh, when the boys come in, you know, rob her trafficker. Um, and then one of the boys, a 16-year-old, shoots and kills him. Uh, so they charge her with felony murder, and she gets a life with parole sentence after 25 years. Uh, folks might remember the case of Centoya Brown. Mm -hmm. Governor Haslam in Tennessee commuted her sentence last year. She was freed in August. Um, she had received a life with parole sentence uh, after she had uh, served 54 years, a minimum of 54 years, uh, for having killed a John who had picked her up and was attempting to rape her. Um, her trafficker was a man by the name of Cutthroat, who had been a brutal guerrilla pimp who had forced her into this situation. And the man who picked her up, picked her up at a Sonic, she was hungry and he bought her food and then brought her back to his house. And that's where the murder occurred. Um, so all across the country, we see instances of these very vulnerable children uh, who oftentimes are engaged in other criminal behavior. And because of the grooming process that they go through, because of the uh, history of violence and trauma that they've experienced, they've developed a traumatic bond with their abuser, with their exploiter, with their trafficker, and oftentimes see no other way out. Now, unfortunately, there's a gap in the law. Uh, most folks, when they hear these stories, are like, well, why didn't they qualify for self-defense? Um, that's sort of the, the, the general thought. Uh, the problem with the self-defense statutes and the reason why Section 1 in S-217 is needed is because oftentimes in order to, uh, to benefit from a self-defense theory, you need to be able to show that uh, there was an imminent threat or danger where your life was in danger or you were going to suffer a great bodily harm. Uh, because many of these cases involve girls who act in premeditation, where they actually they do plan out to kill their trafficker. And it's a very unfortunate situation. But because of that dynamic, what will happen is they will face the exact same mandatory minimum sentencing that anybody else convicted of first degree murder would, or any other crime that they might commit against their abuser. Um, it's unfortunate that this is the reality where we still see folks in law enforcement prosecutors bringing charges against kids in these situations. Um, it's an abhorrent practice. It is a violation of these children's human rights. Uh, Article. 39 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child specifically states that the obligation of the state when you're dealing with a child who's experienced trauma and harm in a form of trafficking is to focus on the treatment and rehabilitation of these children, not to lock them away in cages. And that's exactly what's happening in these instances. And so section one of this bill is really concerned with making sure that there are adequate safeguards in place so that, God forbid, any case like this ever arises here in the state of Vermont, 
a child in that situation will be protected and not suffer an added human rights violation of a lengthy prison sentence. Now, this doesn't mandate that the judge do anything. You know, there's still a requirement that the person who is uh, accused of committing a very serious crime uh, prove by clear and convincing evidence that they are, in fact, a trafficking victim and that the person whom they've committed the offense against was the person who did this to them. But if a judge does, in fact, find that, what we're basically saying is let's take the handcuffs off of judges so that they're not required to just impose a life sentence and a lengthy mandatory minimum, but can actually come up with an age-appropriate and trauma-informed response in situations like this. Should we try Sarah again? Um, it may be that I'm looking at, she's in California? Yes. It's only 6 a.m. there. That may be why she's in. Yeah. <laughs> I did email her. She did get back. Let's try. Sorry. Good morning, Sarah. This is uh, Senator Dick Sears. You're um, with the Senate Judiciary Committee here in Vermont. Thank you for being available. I know it's extremely early out in California. Uh, James Dole is here and has been talking about you, and, and you're going to be our next witness. Um, but I understood you wanted to listen to some of James's testimony. So, uh, we uh, have a number of people in the, in the room. Also, um, it is being filmed by a local uh, cable television uh, outlet. So, uh, just so you're aware of that, and uh, can you hear us okay? Yes, you guys sound great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yes. we might turn it up just a little bit, but um, so uh, we're going to be listening to James's testimony. Then you'll be the next witness. And thank okay, you for thank you. thank you for accommodating our uh, 9 a.m. here. 6 a.m. out there. No problem. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. James, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Sarah. Um, and so that is really the genesis for the law. And I will say, you know, there's been a recent shift in the way that we've looked at juveniles over the last 15 to 20 years, um, really beginning with the emergence of juvenile brain and behavioral development science that has shown that there are fundamental differences between juvenile and adult brains. Uh, in particular, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for executive functioning. Uh, it's not fully developed in children, which is why children rely on a more primitive part of the brain called the amygdala uh, to make decisions and process information. That part of the brain and that process of development is hindered and, and uh, inhibited when children experience severe amounts of trauma. And so you have to sort of look at you know, the brain development in conjunction with the trauma that children experience. And the Supreme Court actually of the United States has noted this in a, in a series of uh, recent decisions, in, in, in a series of decisions called Roper, uh, Miller, Graham, and Montgomery. The Supreme Court has repeatedly said that the penological justifications for imposing harsh punishments on children begin to fall when we look at the developmental differences of who they are. And perhaps nowhere is there a better example of that than children in situations like this where they've committed acts of violence or committed crimes against the people who've abused them. Um, and so this is really about creating a new standard by which uh, judges can uh, look at these cases, look at kids in uh, situations like Sarah, like Centoya, like Alexis, and make sure that we're not adding additional trauma uh, to what they've already experienced. And um, the last thing I'll just say is, um, you know, when, it, as you listen to Sarah's testimony, uh, the one thing that I, I would really urge committee members to do is just think about if, if Sarah was your daughter, or Sarah, or Alexis was your daughter, or one of these other girls was your daughter, what would you want to have happen in situations like this? Would you want a judge to have to impose the harshest possible punishment because they're mandated by law? Or would you want the law to have flexibility enough to create a trauma-informed and age-appropriate response? And that's what this is, is truly about. In my testimony in the folder, you'll find um, a couple of stories. Absolutely. 
Um, there are stories from around the country. Alexis's story, Crystal's story is attached to my testimony. Um, there's also on the right-hand side a number of stories that have been written uh, about the work that Sarah and, and I have been doing around the country to raise awareness about this issue. Um, the HuffPost has covered it. Bills have been introduced on this issue all around the country, including recently in, in the U.S. Congress by a Republican Congressman, Bruce Westerman, uh, from Arkansas. For context about uh, Congressman Westerman, he occupies the 4th Congressional District in Arkansas, which is the uh, former seat of Tom Cotton. Uh, many would say probably the most conservative member of the U.S. Senate, so it's a very conservative district. And so just for context about the bipartisan nature by which these bills have been introduced and the support across the political spectrum for making sure that uh, kids in situations like this um, don't have to receive these harsh punishments. Um, and with that, I'm happy to yield time for questions on the law uh, about anything within Section 1 um, or any questions in general. Um, I'll just say, too, I, I, I meant to mention this earlier, uh, the National Human Trafficking uh, Research Center National Hotline uh, has uh, received about 124 instances since 2007 of human trafficking cases here in Vermont, um, 24 cases from 2018 alone. Um, so this is a very real problem that Vermont has, in fact, been, had been dealing with. And what we see when we look even beyond that, the National, uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimates that roughly 100,000 U.S. children are exploited in prostitution every single year, um, and about one in nine girls conservatively and one in 53 boys, again, very conservative estimates, are victims of childhood sexual abuse. I'm actually a survivor of child sexual abuse and child labor trafficking myself. It was one of the impetuses for forming human rights for kids and wanting to address these issues. And so when we look at all of this, it's, it's important to understand the context in which this is happening and being able to create a legal system that is more flexible and able uh, to respond to cases like this. And so with that, I'll go ahead and yield my time. But we would definitely urge the committee uh, to support this legislation and thank Senator Sears very much for bringing it. He's been a stalwart champion for many, many years on these issues, and we thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, please go ahead. Okay. Excuse me. Thank and you. Thank you for the bravery of being here with us this morning. Thank you. Um, I really believe in, in the why behind it. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. So it's Sarah Jeffrey Cruzon, and for the majority of my life, I was I just cruise on W five nine seven zero zero while haunted by horrendous and embarrassing unspeakable situations that I was subjected to by adults and the community members in my life. To this day, I'm in therapy attempting to make sense of the why behind it all. Being an invisible voice as an unidentified victim of child sex trafficking for so many years, I find that Sarah's law would allow judges the discretion make decisions based on trauma-informed best practices to enhance the overall wellness of our children who come in contact with our justice system. The vast majority of children in the justice system are contending with early childhood trauma and unmitigated adverse childhood experiences. I was one of them. I experienced 10 out of the 10 adverse childhood experiences. Um, when I was in elementary school, and uh, his life was abruptly interrupted by George Howard, the man who would soon rob me of my childhood coming home from school. Um, he was able to, you know, convince me to get in his car. I lived in a community where drugs and abuse were the norm, and I was an easy target for, for him, his like sinister intention. I also think that he was a man who himself was coming from a place of unidentified trauma. And from the ages of 13 to 16, um, I was sex trafficked. The horrific types of abuse and rape and torture I could have from my trafficker and other adult males. And at 16, through an act of violence, I shot and killed him. Despite being a victim of child sex trafficking, um, sex abuse and rape, 
By the man who I killed, I was tried as an adult where none of the abuse and complex traumas I experienced throughout my childhood were admitted into evidence. I had no victim's advocate. I had no therapeutic modality dealing with trauma. Informed care offered to me, and as a rape victim, I was my only witness. After two and a half days on trial, I was ordered to pay $10,000 in victim's restitution and to serve a life without parole sentence for four years. <clears throat> the judge and the media depicted me only as a sophisticated monster, the worst of the worst, and sentenced me as such. The justice system sentenced me for killing the man who victimized me for nearly a third of my young life. And years later, thanks to tireless work of my legal team and community advocates, my sentence was commuted and reduced by former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. After 19 years and seven months, I was told well, what happened to me was not justice. What happened to other children of child sex trafficking victims like Alex, Alexis, I'm sorry guys, Alexis Martin and Detroit Brown in Tennessee who also received by justice for crimes committed against their traffickers, not justice. None of us should have to be sent to prison in the first place. It's a far too common response for girls of color in our country, especially for actions that are taken against our rapists and traffickers. <clears throat> Being silenced, sexually assaulted, raped, trafficked, and degraded creates deep wounds, especially for us as children. And every day these wounds require courage, grace, and an undefined strength to overcome. When I was silenced, I felt invisible. I felt my voice and life experiences held no value. That I, as a person, had no value. I was labeled as a child prostitute, a murderer, a convicted teen killer, and a teen prostitute who killed her pimp and was sent to live out the rest of my days in prison. Like an animal. All the sympathy and compassion seemed to be reserved for my rapist and sex trafficker and that very little for me. Nelson Mandela once said there is no king of revelation of society's soul in the way we treat our children. What does it say about our soul then if we allow our children who have been trafficked to be sentenced to decades in prison for having committed crimes against their people without offering them opportunity to heal? And I believe that the children of Vermont, Vermont deserve better than this, as all children. I believe that Sarah's law would allow discretion <clears throat> to make sure what has happened to me never happened to a child victim in Vermont. And under this legislation, judges will be given greater flexibility in cases like mine to deviate from mandatory minimum sentences and to spend any sentences as so to not keep a child victim in cages and silenced. I believe that children like us deserve to be protected by the system and not traumatized by it. And this legislation before you offers an opportunity to contribute <clears throat> to a healing component within our justice system that is very needed. So I ask let us not allow the justice system to take anything else away from child trafficking victims and sexual abuse survivors. We have been forced to give away too much already. And Vermont has an opportunity to do better and be a national leader so that child trafficking victims in situations like mine are met with empathy, <coughs> compassion, understanding and love. And may we, with mindful intentions, end our continuous act of violence upon one another. So I say thank you with deep regard and respect for having an opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I yes. can't imagine how difficult it is for you. And, uh, questions? Or no. no. It's hard to... Uh, very difficult testimony to hear how you were first misused by the abuser and the trafficker and then misused by the criminal justice system. Um, so, uh, thank you for being willing to speak out. Uh, too often people aren't willing to speak out and that's why the, uh, these, these things continue. Um, <clears throat> 
I don't. I think the committee is at a point where it probably uh, doesn't have questions. But if you would like to stay on the line, and James is still here, and we have some other witnesses, you're welcome to. But again, uh, my thanks for your willingness to come forward to try to change uh, the law so that other other children don't have to go with, through what you went through. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to go. I have a little person I have to get ready. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Absolutely. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you. Um, uh, that's, I feel sorry for who has to come up next. Yeah. Uh, James. I always feel bad for James. <laughs> it comes up. By the way, I saw your wife with TV. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Something about kids, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm She's always expert. talking about kids, yeah. She's taking the Let's Grow Kids very seriously. <laughs> um, James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. So this bill has a number of different sections. I'll just go through them one at a time because we are very supportive of some and others uh, we have some concerns about. Okay. Uh, section one that we were just discussing that um, James Dole and Sarah were talking about, um, we are, of course, um, very supportive of that section. Um, essentially, it authorizes courts to consider mitigating factors um, in very extreme situations um, and you know of course being the victim of sex, sex trafficking is probably the most extreme situation and should be considered by the court. Courts are already permitted to look at um, mitigating factors and all sorts of evidence when sentencing um, and to um, give them more flexibility um, to really take into account the specific dynamics of any crime, I think, uh, for, um, for this type of situation is, is really important. Um, so I'll just move on. Um, section two, uh, this is a provision. It looks very similar to the one that the state's attorneys, potentially identical to the one that the Department of State's attorneys supported. Um, in the House, um, this is the immunity from liability. Um, this is uh, an incredibly important harm prevention measure. Um, you know, we want um, people that are in these situations to report uh, these types of crimes. And you know, you look at the types of crimes. You know, I know that these are felony possession crimes, but these are some of our lower priority crimes. Um, and you know when you think when you compare it to the protection that this provision offers to the people engaged in um, well now I don't want to say sex work uh, but the people that are engaged in this industry um, that you know on balance I think there's a big net benefit to this um, to, to this immunity and we already do this for of course overdose cases and uh, you know we would support we support it for the same reasons as those cases. Um, we also supported the Sex Work Study Committee, um, or whatever the final terminology is on that. Um, and again, just as I mentioned in the House, you know, we're the Executive Director of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, or the designee. You know, this is an incredibly important um, study committee. Um, these laws haven't been updated in a while, and I think that we would probably not put either John or me on that, probably find a real expert um, amongst the state's attorneys on this. Um, uh, the only thing I, I would add is I don't, need the need, I don't see the need for the legislative members other than to get the legislative council involved. I don't know why. Anyway, mm -hmm. we'll it, talk about that. Right, right yeah, I mean, in the, yeah, I think mm -hmm. what we would like, it, I, what they talked about in the House is trying to get either current or former actual sex workers involved to kind of hear their stories and hear what um, recommendations they might have. Um, section four and five, I'm just going to talk about together because they're very similar. This is the motion to vacate for victims of domestic assault or sexual assault. Um, we have some very serious concerns about this, these two sections. Um, I mean, just as written, um, 
the types of qualifying crimes are very expansive. It's anything but the Big 12. Um, you know, specifically to the language, um, you know, there's this is essentially applies to any crime that, I mean, it, it says the conviction, if it was obtained as a result of the person having been a victim of domestic assault, um, that's pretty broad, I would say. If I get, I understand what the intent is, but the way it's written, I don't see really much limitation on what crimes that could apply to. Um, if I am the victim of domestic assault, there's a presumption that any crime that I commit is a result of my being a victim of domestic assault under subsection E, D, or yeah, subsection D. And then, so that, and so the court has to grant the motion to vacate if I can show that I was convicted of a qualifying crime, meaning any crime other than the Big 12, and the conviction was obtained as a result of me having been a victim of domestic assault. So it's a mandatory vacate. Um, and there's only two provisions, and the one provision, subsection B, there's a presumption that that is met under subsection E. Um, so, you know, there's any number of situations I could describe where it just seems illogical. If I am the victim of domestic assault and I go burn down someone's house, it doesn't even have to be the person who assaulted me, then um, I could mm -hmm. seek to have my, um, I could mm -hmm. seek to have my uh, conviction vacated. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, you know, does this apply to people who are in custody under sentence? And if so, you know, I would file the second I was convicted, I would file a motion to vacate, and the court would have to grant it. Um, mm -hmm. There's no kind of interest of justice determination made by the court. Um, there's no kind of discussion of the proportionality of the crime that um, the victim committed compared to the domestic assault. There's no even linkage to the domestic mm -hmm. assault. Um, there's no consideration of who the victim is, whether it's the assailant or a third party. And there's no consideration of whether the person is currently in custody under, I mean, if this was allowing for expungement of certain crimes, I could understand that, but, or if this was um, kind of considered a mitigating factor, I could understand that. Um, but this is a totally different thing. And so it just seems to me that this needs to be considered pretty closely. Well, at the time that we, whenever, remember we get to the point of market, we'll certainly look at that section. I, yeah, go ahead. How would, um, and looking at um, B on line nine on page seven, and the same, but farther on in the other section, how, how would, one prove or disprove that the action was a result of, I mean, prove the connection that. Well, so actually, if you look at lines 17 through 21, there's actually a presumption um, that if uh, you can oh, show your status as a victim of domestic assault, you're presumed to have met subsection B already. Okay. All right. Okay. So you don't even have to. No, that there was it, any... it seems like the state would actually have to overcome that presumption. Okay, uh, yeah. And okay. So. Yeah, I, I get it. Thank you. It seems like, you know. Well, yeah. uh, hopefully okay. you have alternative language. I, I will have was alternative. There's no rush. I think okay. what we'll probably do, given that it's nobody's fault, my fault, and I guess if you want to blame somebody, Representative Rad and myself for not talking, but since the House has just passed the bill and others, there's no point in us passing bills in the nighttime. So um, we might, we'll, we'll probably wait till after crossover and, and add whatever we do from 217 to whatever number their bill is and amend their bill with a strike off whatever we end up but we'll work from this bill okay so you have plenty of time to give us alternative language okay plenty of time on legislative that. parlance is three to four weeks right that's more than most people ever get <laughs>
and that's fine. And we, we would certainly think that someone being a victim of domestic or sexual assault should be considered by the courts when, when sentencing and um, could be a significant mitigating factor to the sentence. Somebody's made human trial, but, that, but they're also important to note that the more we learn about the women who are incarcerated in Vermont, how many of them are, were victims of sexual assault or victims of domestic violence themselves, uh, grew up in homes where domestic violence and sexual assault was prevalent. Um, and, and some of the men who are incarcerated also, um, but particularly the women. The more we learn about that, the more con concerned I am that we um, deal with those problems and not exasperate them by locking them up for a long time. Um, again, um, what we talked about yesterday on the floor of the Senate is moving from a um, offense-based criminal justice system to a risk-based criminal justice system. And that's what justice reinvestment attempts to right. move us in that direction. So hopefully the state's attorneys will begin to look more at the risk of the individual uh, in sentencing options rather than the offense. That's right. I realize that murder is going to be murder and you know, you, you're know going to deal with that, but some of these other crimes. That's right. And you know, one thing that we're trying to do, I want to just, you know, okay, go ahead. No, I just, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I was just on, I'm on another subcommittee that's looking at risk assessment tools and trying to find ones that don't rely so heavily on the prior criminal history record of the individual because we know of all the factors that can influence that and the kind of uh, cyclical issues with uh, once you enter the criminal justice system um, to really determine risk based on a number of other factors other than just a straight criminal history record. Sometimes we should listen to the, to the voices. Um, Thinking it. Um, can we hurt this kid any more than they've already been hurt? With whatever punishment we choose to do out. All right. Dole, not don't. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall Paul, the juvenile defender, or whatever. Good morning. Good morning. Marshall Paul, uh, juvenile defender, or whatever. <laughs> well, I'm never sure your title is. You I try deputy, to keep it. I'll, I'll tell I, you I think trick. I should promote you to Deputy Defender General. I've okay. already been promoted to Deputy Defender okay. General, but I try not to tell people here that because there's some sort of a hierarchy when they schedule people. Yeah. Um, they put commissioners and deputies ahead of like staff attorneys, but I like going last. Okay. So I try not to let anybody know about the deputy thing. Oh. Just keep it as <laughs> staff deputy attorney. attorney. The deputy attorney. Defender General, not Attorney General. The Attorney I, General's right after Yeah, you. I don't actually even want that job. You don't um, want that job. I don't okay. want to be Deputy Attorney, Attorney General. <laughs> so um, the Defender General's office certainly supports this bill. I want to start, we'll go through section by section, but um, I mean, I, th I think our testimony is pretty straightforward. We're very supportive of uh, section one, but we would be uh, a lot, a big improvement to section one would be to raise the age from 18 to 25. Um, the reason that we suggest that is that it's our experience uh, in representing people who have been sexually trafficked in Vermont, um, that while there is, I've represented a fair number of clients who have been sexually trafficked um, who, as juveniles, as people who are under 18. I haven't actually represented a single one who was sexually trafficked in Vermont. I've represented people, uh, mostly it's been kids who were sexually trafficked out of the state, returned to the state um, under the interstate compact, and that's how I end up having uh, an interaction with them. Um, and I just, you know, just my experience and the experience of other people who represent juveniles in my office is that we see victims of sexual trafficking. We don't see many that are actually sexually trafficked in Vermont. That's not true, though, of people over the age of 18. We do see people who have been sexually trafficked in Vermont um, who are over the age of 18, 
certainly I think pretty much everybody in my office who I sort of talked to yesterday, um, just saying, you know, I've, how many times have you seen this? Everybody could name a few just off the top of their head. So I think it is something that is fairly common in Vermont for people over the age of 18, probably less common for people under the age of 18. Part of the other reason that we suggest raising the age of 25 is it doesn't really, it doesn't really cost anything. Uh, you know, this provision is not a get out of jail free card. All this provision does is give a judge the authority to deviate from a minimum mandatory sentence, really for reasons uh, but like Senator Sears said, you know, when you're looking at someone who's already been so incredibly damaged and hurt by their circumstances, um, and then perhaps committed a crime, and perhaps a very inappropriate crime, perhaps a very wrong crime, and perhaps a crime that's deserving of punishment. Um, but this just simply allows a judge to look at it and say, you know what, when it comes to that minimum mandatory sentence, um, uh, or when it comes to the ability to suspend a portion of a sentence, um, this give, this would give the judge the opportunity to take into account the context, what that person had been through, the damage that that person had already suffered in setting that sentence, and doesn't require them to. The judge could turn around and say, you know what, I've looked at your situation and I still think that what you did was cold-blooded and evil and I'm not going to deviate from the minimum mandatory sentence, and I'm not going to suspend any portion of the sentence. So it really puts flexibility in the hands of the judges to deal with a really wide variety of um, contexts that come up. And it's not prescriptive. It doesn't tell them what they must do. It just gives them some options. So we're very supportive of uh, mm -hmm. Section 1. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. to be consistent with our new laws, it should at least be 20 under 20 because we're going to raise the age to 18 and then 19. So. I agree. So I don't, I, we can debate whether it should be 25, but it very almost automatically we should start thinking of that when we're mm -hmm. doing criminal statutes where we're raising the age to 20. Mm -hmm. Under 20, excuse me. So section two, our testimony is very straightforward. We support this. We support very similar legislation in the House. I um, think that this is really absolutely just sort of a common sense uh, extension of the Good Samaritan law that we already have for uh, drug use and drug uh, overdose. Well, you and the state's attorneys. We, we actually, the state's attorneys are remarkable down on this bill. We agree with them on section three, the sex work study committee. Um, just touching on your comment about having legislators on the committee. <coughs> I would say that just my experience over the summer with having legislators on the Sentencing Commission, was it was very helpful to have legislators on the committee, uh, in part because they gave us a little bit of legislative. We, we spend a lot of time on these summer study committees trying to guess exactly what we should be doing. Um, and it's helpful to have legislators who were involved in uh, deeply in passing the legislation on the committees because we often turned to them over the summer to give sort of a legislative gloss on, you know, we'd all look around and say, I think this is what they want us to do. And then we would turn to Representative Lalonde and say, Rep Representative Lalonde, is this what you wanted us to do? Um, and that gave us some direction and it provided some guidance in places where it was really helpful. So while I don't think it's a make or break situation, whether there's legislators on the committee or not, um, I certainly found it to be helpful in the context of the Sentencing Commission and would support having them on uh, the Sex Work Study Committee. But again, um, we have plenty of committees that we've bumbled through without any legislators to help us, so. Uh, <coughs> uh, so sections four and five, we support these sections. Um, you know, the uh, uh, Attorney Pepper raised a few points, but I think all of those points are really sort of wrapped up in this question of the presumption. Uh, a presumption is just a presumption. It's a starting point. It says that if somebody has been shown to have been a victim, then it's presumed that their, uh, that their offense was caused by their whatever offense they were a victim of, the, you know, that their uh, DV, you know, that whatever other offense they commit was caused by their DV conviction. Um, and I, you know, I guess I'm a little bit puzzled by the state's attorney's objection to that because it's not like it's some sort of a hard and fast rule. All it is is something that, so for the, the example that he gave, 
someone who's a victim of some sexual or domestic violence offense and then goes and burns down a house that's com of someone that's completely unrelated to the offense. Um, that wouldn't seem to be a really hard thing, a hard thing for the uh, state's attorney to overcome the presumption in that case. And I'm a little bit sort of um, put off by the idea that whenever there's a provision that requires the state's attorneys to do something in order for the result to be anything besides a loss for the defendant, um, that there's an objection to that because the state's attorneys would have to do something. It's their job to overcome presumptions. It's their job to put up evidence uh, when there's evidence to be put up. Uh, I don't think it's a problem to turn around and say, you know what, we're going to presume that if somebody's had one of these convictions, that that conviction was in fact caused by this underlying context, and that it's up to the state's attorneys to show otherwise if it's otherwise. Just put it on the state's attorneys and let them prove it. Um, and you know, given the examples that have been thrown around, it shouldn't be that hard to prove in the cases where there's not actually a causal connection. And I wanted to give a couple of examples of where this could apply and why it would be important to apply. So for example, if you were the victim of domestic violence and you called to report that domestic violence, and the police respond and find drugs or stolen property or uh, any other kind of contraband like that in your possession, um, this would give you a way out of that charge. Or for example, if you called the police to report that you were a victim of sexual assault and you gave a statement about that sexual assault. And in the context of that statement, you explained that you had committed various offenses. That, those would be places where convictions would be obtained as a result of your being a victim of domestic or sexual violence. So, you know, to us, that's a pretty common sense provision. It would, it would encourage people to report instances of domestic and sexual violence, um, and it would allow people who are reporting uh, instances of domestic and sexual violence to be completely open about what it is that that's happened and what the context of their uh, report is. So we find this to be a pretty common sense, pretty straightforward provision that we would support. And I think that to the extent that there's objections around the presumption language, um, we should either look at that as, and just sim simply say, you know what, that's on the prosecutors. If they want to overcome the presumption, they can overcome the presumption. They just have to put on some evidence. Um, or we could make, tweak that language to better reflect that, you know, I'm not sure what would be done for the language to change. Um, so. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Isn't your two, the two examples that you gave, aren't they covered under section um, two? Section two would only apply if the person was involved in prostitution or human trafficking. Section four and five would apply in cases of domestic and sexual violence. Okay, but okay, so I, I guess I'm trying to be, be the, the devil's advocate here or whatever, but if we presume that any, uh, that a conviction or an action was the result of being a victim of domestic abuse or sexual assault, why would we not extend that to if you've been a victim of childhood trauma or poverty or a disability. I, I mean, there are a lot of things that lead to um, I understand that. I think that the real issue there is that when it comes to like, for example, childhood trauma caused, caused by non-domestic or sexual violence context. So the childhood trauma that's caused by um, poverty, divorce, yeah. all, all of those types of uh, adverse childhood experiences. There, we're not talking about balancing two different convictions. This is, the way that I read this, this balances our state's interest in, in two different types of convictions. On the one hand, there's convictions for domestic or sexual violence, and on the other hand, there's convictions for other crimes that are not uh, the most serious felonies. And what this provision is really saying is, we think it's important enough to prosecute domestic and sexual violence that we are willing in cases of domestic and sexual violence to overlook someone's commission of a collateral offense that's caused by them being a victim mm -hmm. of domestic or sexual violence. So it is a balancing of sort of different values in terms of which crimes do we 
sort of elevate in importance over another one. And that's not an issue when you're talking about adverse childhood experiences or poverty or any of those things that are non-criminal but can result in uh, someone, somebody's behaviors later on in life. Uh, because really what you're, because there you're not balancing the interest in convictions for two different types of crimes. So I just see this as a way of saying, look, you know, essentially saying to state's attorneys, look, we as a state have decided prosecution of this offense is important and we want to protect the prosecution of this offense even if that means not prosecuting some other less serious offenses. I'd like to hear from other witnesses on this section, on these two sections, but I, factually everybody has a story, right? I mean, everybody has an excuse for, for behavior too. You would look at, say, everybody has a story, Anybody can give you a reason for their behavior, um, and does does being subject to, to domestic assault, and I don't want to minimize that, but does that allow the person to behave in a certain way that um, results in uh, certain crimes? That, that's what I think the state's attorneys are concerned with that it should be a mitigating factor, but maybe it shouldn't be a factor to completely absolve the person of any responsibility for whatever happened. If, if it's a directed, if an assault was directed at a person who was assaulting you, mm -hmm. or the crime was directed particularly at that person, then that, I think, is much more understandable than suggesting that the, that the what I was getting that, that from James, and maybe I'm wrong, James Pepper, was that it's really hard to get to the door. Fired that door, by the way. I've complained. Um, I'm calling yeah, Chris no. Holt. Well, they say they can't use WD-40 anymore. WD-40. Well, I, I, I guess it's somebody decided they can't use it. Back to where I was. Okay. The concern, is, I think what I heard, the concern from James, and maybe it's James Pepper, and maybe it's not, not not what's, what I'm reading here is not that, but so a, a person is a victim of domestic violence and then they go out and violate a law or against somebody who's absolutely not connected with that act. Is that, is that what you're... Mm -hmm. So all the state does that would have to do in that case is stand up in court and say, there's absolutely no evidence that this was caused by that. And in a case that's so, where it's so crystal clear that this was not caused by that, them just standing up and asserting it would probably be enough to overcome the presumption. But shouldn't we write it so to make sure that they don't have to overcome that presumption? That the fact that somebody had, again, I, I'm, I, I mean. Somebody gets a presumption in every case. The Sarah story there. An that, awful lot of them. Yeah, but, that's but Sarah's the story was completely directed at that offender. The other stories that James presented us were completely directed at the offender. What I'm concerned with, this looks like it says, whatever you might do as a result of the domestic violence or what, um, Not even as a result or, of or sexual assault is... And that's true only if it is caused by the conviction. And there's a presumption that it's caused by the conviction but the state's attorneys can just put on some evidence to overcome that presumption. What kind of evidence would you put on to overcome that? It would depend on the case. If it was a case where somebody, like the example that Attorney Pepper used, where somebody burnt down a house that was completely unrelated to their uh, domestic violence victim status, uh, then I don't think you would have to put on much evidence at all. I think you'd probably just have to stand up and assert it, but you could certainly put on some evidence, you can put on the owner of the building to stand up and say, I have no idea who this person is, I've never had anything to do with them, and I've certainly never been involved in any domestic violence with them. You could put on um, the, I think in a petition to vacate, that would be in civil court, so you could actually probably call the defendant <coughs> themselves and put them on the stand. So if I were the defense attorney, and I'm not, but Joe is, I would say that, um, I mean, if I were the other attorney, I, I would say that, um, but the abuser in this case um, talked about 
fire all the time. And I, I mean, I, I don't know, but it just does seem to me that there are I think you, I, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to convince judges to do things for criminal defendants than I think people picture that it is. Um, it's really not that easy to convince a judge that they should that they should cut a break to a criminal defendant. Uh, so, you know, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Like, you could, as a defense attorney, get up and say that. As a defense attorney, I never would because I'd lose all my credibility in the court and be laughed at in court, and nobody would ever take me seriously again. Um, so it really, like, I think it's I think it's a lot harder to convince judges of this kind of stuff than than you're picturing. Um, I, I think we've kicked this can enough, but okay. you get our concern. Understandable. There may be a better way to draft this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just have time here from the Attorney General. Uh, we'll hear from Sarah Robinson the next time we take the bill up, if that's okay with you, Sarah. No. Sorry, I don't think we're going to get to you. And then anyone else who wants to testify when we take this up shortly after crossover, let me know. Or let Peggy know. Good morning, David Chair with the Attorney morning, General's David. Office. Good. Um, thank you for having me this morning. I did have uh, Peggy Delaney hand around to you a copy of the Act 32 report that um, was produced in cooperation with the network. It was actually drafted uh, by, at least in part, by Sarah Robinson, who's here behind me, um, and just wanted to bring that to the committee's attention, not for full review right now, but to let the committee know that we uh, work cooperatively with um, the networking with the Center for Crime Victim Services, and some of the stuff in this bill uh, is a sort of direct result yeah, of those this, this recommendations. Maybe handed it out while we were just taking up uh, the testimony. Oh, 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 this, this letter part? Yeah, yeah, this is the letter. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, David. Uh, so I won't go into that in great detail, but just wanted to let the committee know that that, uh, that is the background for some of where this is coming from. Um, turning to the bill, uh, we certainly have, I'll move pretty quickly through the bill because uh, other witnesses have spoken well about what the bill is going to do and how it will do it, uh, but we certainly support section one, uh, no issues there. I certainly think it's important for people to be able, for the justice system in general, to be able to take into account the full circumstances of what's really happened as often as it possibly can. Uh, and certainly that provision and many of the other provisions in here go toward that goal. Uh, section two, uh, we also support that, as other folks mentioned, very similar to a uh, bill up in the House, which we supported. Um, section three on the study committee, we support that as well. Um, and I'm sure we can work through any tweaks on the membership, but um, in concept, that's certainly something we support and look forward to working on. With respect to sections four and five, uh, it won't surprise the committee to hear perhaps that we share some of the concerns of the state's attorneys. And I actually think the committee has really already hit at the core of the problem, so I won't belabor that too much, but the core of the problem is around what it means for a conviction to have been obtained as a result of the person having been a victim of domestic assault. And we're opening this up to a huge number of potential crimes, uh, and with a, so essentially it's allowing for a second bite of the apple after a conviction for a very large number of offenses and without having a clear understanding of what it means for the conviction to have been obtained as a result of the person having been a victim, uh, I think we uh, don't really know what territory we're walking into, and there could be arguments that are very attenuated from the behavior in question in the most recent conviction with the prior um, act that created the victimhood. It could be that um, an adverse childhood experience, which could qualify under sub, subsection A1, or, uh, or sorry, subsection A2, um, is then the, you know, created trauma, which then resulted in somebody doing something many years later, even decades later. Um, and that, under the terms of this, might actually be something that would be a reason, a cause for uh, vacating the sentence. It certainly should be the case in a sentencing that all of those prior 
realities of a person's life. <laughs> it's not your fault, Virginia, but it's just, it's really getting aggravating. It's like a, a my tooth. Of, of the no, I've got my WD-40 in the car, and even if David Sheet says I can't use it, I'm coming in. I, don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why they banned WD-40. Huh? Lines have said you can't. Oh, well, I don't, whoever says Why they I can't. banned WD-40, I don't know. We probably did it right here in this building in one of those <laughs> chemical bills. Yeah. Well, sure that's what happens. <laughs> I've got it in my car and it's going to be used this <laughs> afternoon. I bet you Mecklenburg <laughs> probably put that right yeah. down our throats. WD 40. Really? So that's what we have to put up with. Okay, sorry. Anyway, David, go ahead. Um, so and I was just trying to summarize the issue and. and uh, Deputy Defender General Call, sorry to use the title, um, had a different interpretation of what this might mean. And his interpretation, as I understood it, or one of his interpretations, was more around reporting, was sort of like an after the fact immunity provision, it's more similar to how the Section 3 would work, which may be a defensible reading, but I think that the fact that it's a little bit unclear as to what exactly we are doing here is part of the problem that we have to overcome. It's, as I read this, once you go down this trail, you wonder why you, why we wouldn't include victims of child sex, uh, child, uh, child, Trump child ethics. abuse, um, and poverty, and poverty, and even though that's not a crime, well, it not is poverty. a crime. Child, but. child. If you're a victim of child abuse, mm -hmm. then you know why? Why wouldn't we include that? I, I, and I'll just close by saying that, uh, to return to a comment I made earlier in my testimony, we certainly are believers in making sure the criminal justice system can take into account all the circumstances that are relevant to a situation. We need to do better about doing that. And through that lens, we're certainly happy to work on um, these provisions and see what we can do to make something Let me better. offer a olive branch here to you and to the state's attorneys would hopefully work with any others coming back here after March. When is the class over? Nine. It's, uh, oh. I think it's March 9th we come back. The March. 13th is uh, crossover. Sometime, oh, right. 13th is yeah. crossover. Why don't we come, we come back. back to here on, um, well, I won't say St. Patrick's Day. We'll give you until the 18th to come back with some kind of recommendations of how you would think we should what language, and if you could work with Michelle on that, and anybody else who has thoughts on how to deal with this section, would be happy to. So we're going to put this in as house James. bill? Yeah, I uh, was going to just remark, if I could, um, real quick. I was listening to both the statements by prosecutors and defense attorneys, and I think it's interesting because there are two sort of different aspects of this that raise concern. On the one hand, you know, I'm thinking of cases in the domestic violence context. If you have a mother, for example, or father, who you know ends up allowing an abusive situation with their children to take place, and they're able to vacate those convictions. We would be concerned about that from a human rights standpoint for children, because children get harmed. On the other hand, one of the cases I began to think about was the case of Catherine Jones, who was a 13-year-old girl in the state of Florida, who ended up, uh, ended up getting convicted of murder. Um, she was one of the youngest people ever convicted in the United States for that offense. And her and her brother, she had been sexually abused by a man that was living in her house. And it was a very brutal uh, sexual, sexual abuse crime. It was documented by DCF. Um, they never removed the children from the home, so she was forced to stay in the home. And in that particular case, her and her brother Curtis, because none of the adults, none of the people from Protective Services were listening to them or helping them, they devised this plan that they're going to kill her dad and all of the adults in the house that are allowing this to happen. Um, so they end up killing her father's girlfriend. Um, her brother does, she doesn't. And after that point, they kind of freak out. And they run into the woods and then they're later apprehended. And so I think about in the context of situations where the, almost kind of like Sarah's story, but not quite, where you have a kid in a very tough situation and some sort of crime is committed against you know, an adult who is kind of responsible or rising out of those fact patterns. You know, that might be a situation, like the Defender General said, where you would want judges to have flexibility. So I think it is a very complicated issue, but perhaps there's a way to look at it, you know, specifically within 
um, you know, maybe it's age, maybe it's looking at, um, you know, the particular circumstances that give rise to those sorts of crimes. But I just wanted to throw that out there because I do, I could see cases that arise where this provision could be really helpful for, for victims of crimes, and then there's others where we would have concerns if, if you know, a crime was vacated. Thank you. David, anything else? No, no. Can I just add something? Yeah, I just want to say, so for those of you who are going to work on it, is because the language that's in four and five is directly copied from what we have mm -hmm. for victims of human trafficking and crimes they may commit as a result of the trafficking. So even if the committee decides to go not broaden it to include victims of domestic uh, of domestic assault or sexual assault, I think every you guys have identified something that you have concern about with the existing elements of current law, so I would say, you know, thinking about the different aspects of that, because they may choose not to pursue the policy of expansion to other areas, but it sounds as though you have concerns about something that's already there. That's already in law. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We'll